For most of history, the Arctic's unforgiving landscape deterred human activity. By 2030, however, it is projected that the ice caps will diminish sufficiently to make the oceans navigable in the summer. These persistent, changing meteorological conditions reveal not only new shipping routes, but also deposits of natural resources that were previously off-limits. Russia, Canada and the United States are all gearing up to dominate the area. But as the Arctic comes under the geopolitical spotlight, distant China feels obliged to sail north and carve out its own foothold in the polar region. I'm your host Chirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Although the Arctic will remain restricted to navigation, construction and hydrocarbon extraction for years to come, the promise of wealth drives international interests in the region. By some estimates, the Arctic seabed contains about 13% of the world's undiscovered crude oil and 30% of its natural gas, not to mention the riches in terms of minerals, seafood and so on. Meanwhile, new shipping lanes will become available for cargo transportation such as the Northern Sea Route, the Northwest Passage and the Transpolar Passage. As powerhouses far and near rush to secure their claims, it is unavoidable that frictions will emerge in terms of governance, sovereignty and navigation. For China, the stakes are too high to sit this one out. While in the South China Sea, the territorial waters are all claimed and disputed, the Arctic Ocean is mostly uncontested. As such, the Chinese leadership cannot afford to settle as a distant secondary stakeholder while allowing for other powers to dictate the terms of navigation and resource exploitation. So for strategic reasons, the country is entering the competition for the Arctic. Yet, there is something unmistakably odd about China's pursuit, namely that it doesn't border the Arctic Circle or even have a coastline on the Arctic Ocean. In legal terms, the lack of a shoreline deprives a government from making articulate claims to a region. China has sought to bypass its non-literal state by increasing its physical presence in the Arctic Circle. In 1999, the country launched its first research expedition to the polar region. Five years later, it constructed a large research station at Svalbard Island while expanding its economic footprint in Iceland and Greenland. Since then, Beijing has been on a roll. It has stepped up its scientific involvement in the region by using climate change research to forge closer ties with the Nordic countries. As a result, China is now close to joining the Arctic Council as a permanent observer. Furthermore, at home, the Chinese are currently constructing two nuclear-powered icebreakers to add to their growing polar fleet. This Arctic fleet isn't just sitting at the docks. Chinese vessels have traversed and surveyed the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route in the previous years. Finally, in 2018, Beijing revealed its endgame in the Arctic when it released a white paper called The Polar Silk Road, which links China's projects in the Arctic to its signature Belt and Road Initiative. The white paper also declared the People's Republic of China as a near-Arctic state. Never mind that China's most northern settlement is no closer to the Arctic than the German capital, the ambiguity of the self-proclaimed identity grants Beijing the ability to refine its role in the North Pole as time and opportunities go by. Still, being a non-literal state will restrict the country from accessing the resources and passages at will. So despite all its efforts to increase its physical presence, China needs a long-term partner to achieve its objectives in the Arctic. That partner of choice is Russia. Not only do the Russians have the longest Arctic coastline, stretching from the Bering Sea in the east to the Barents Sea in the west, but the Northern Sea Route sails along its northern coast. As the ice caps melt, Chinese vessels are best positioned to benefit from Russia's Northern Sea Route. Ships sailing from the Chinese port of Dalian to Rotterdam in the Netherlands will shorten their travel time by about 10 days. 
For China, the route is also more secure since it avoids the choke points and supply disruptions associated with the existing shipping lanes in Southeast Asia, not to mention the Suez Canal and the Strait of Bab el Mandeb. Hence, sailing by the Northern Sea Route is not only faster, but also eliminates exposure to hazardous seas and choke points. At the same time, however, the vastness of the Arctic and the Russian coastline is a significant security concern for the Kremlin. This is why in the past, Moscow has opposed Beijing's involvement in the Arctic. For instance, on numerous occasions the Russian government refused to issue permissions to Chinese research vessels to enter Russia's economic exclusive zone in the Arctic. Moscow also opposed Beijing's seat as an observer at the Arctic Council, only relenting when South Korea and Japan were given seats. All this shows that Putin holds suspicions that his Chinese counterpart will eventually want to chip away at Russia's sovereignty and sphere of influence in the North Pole. That said, this attitude has changed in recent years. The ruble's collapse in 2014 and the Western sanctions of the Ukrainian crisis in the same year have robbed the Russians of their options. With resources stretched thinly at home, Putin has come around and has shown willingness to cooperate with his counterpart Xi. For Moscow, its economic troubles deprive the state of efficiently exploiting its advantages in the Arctic. So by allying with China, Russia hopes to gain access to Chinese funding and construction expertise. As a compromise, Beijing would gain access to the Arctic passages and resources. At least that is the Russian perspective. China sees things differently. Although President Xi would like to closely cooperate with Putin on Arctic affairs, the short-term Chinese interests lie in the energy sector. Beijing has thus far shown no appetite for the construction of ports, logistic facilities and services. The reason for this is because all of it lies in Russian territory. China feels no rush to invest billions in a region only to strengthen Russia's position in the Arctic. Therefore, policymakers in Beijing believe that once they made the massive investments to build the Russian Arctic from the ground up, the Kremlin will simply abandon the Chinese, excluding them from the economic and security decision-making. China, being a long-term player, needs assurances and guarantees that its financial investments will not be in vain. It needs Russia to concede a part of its sovereignty in the Arctic, giving Beijing authentic ability to project power. But that is not going to happen. Russia does not compromise on its security for commercial purposes. Consequently, mutual fear and suspicion will remain an obstacle going into the future. Yet, like in other fields of Chinese-Russian cooperation, their partnership is a marriage of convenience. Nowhere else can Russia and China find such partners where both stand to gain practical benefits regardless of the competing interests. It's a very big project and of course it has different sides. It can have different uh, implementations, different consequences. But that is not a matter of whether concerns and worries do exist. That's a matter whether we can discuss it, whether we can put it up on the table openly and discuss and find out solution. And we have all the means to do that. We cannot, uh, we don't have any contradictions which are, how to say, uh, uh, cannot be settled. Altogether, as China continues to refine its Polar Silk Road, the state is likely to cooperate with the Russians in areas with immediate benefits such as energy, technology and science. Earlier in 2019, China acquired a 20% stake in the Russian Yamal LNG project on the Yamal Peninsula, a deal that could eventually meet 10 to 25% of China's total LNG needs. It's cooperation in such areas that will emerge in the coming years. Construction-wise, it will have to wait. China is not going to build up the Arctic so that Russia can gain all the strategic advantages. Likewise, Russia is not going to compromise its sovereignty for the sake of economic proceedings. 
so ultimately cooperation between the two will remain limited. All in all, like with so many other grand strategies, China's Arctic ambitions lack a proper roadmap. Instead of a single partner, China is likely to focus on multilateral mechanisms with as many Arctic states as possible in order to bind itself to the North Pole. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you enjoy our work, please consider joining our Patreon community as it helps us to produce more original content like this. The link for it will be in the description. For now, thank you for your time and Sahol. So